Welcome everybody to the next episode of the Cannabis Review. I am delighted to be joined in this episode by Mike Hennessy, who is the VP of Innovation at the world-renowned Wanna Brands. How are you keeping today, Mike? Doing fantastic, and thank you. How are you today? I am absolutely fantastic as well. Thank you very much for taking your time to come on. Do you maybe want to give everybody a little run-through between 30 and 60 seconds of how you ended up coming into the cannabis industry and your position at Wanna Brands? Yeah, so I got involved in the industry in 2013. Um, I had a roommate in college. I, I obviously was consuming cannabis um, for personal use uh, back then and, and found it beneficial. I never felt like it should be something that was illegal. But my roommate had epilepsy, and I was able to realize what med medical benefits it had for him and that it was really able to prevent his seizures and it really just inspired something in me and catalyzed me to want to get involved in the industry. So I moved out to Colorado in 2012, got involved in the industry in 2013, and then started working with Wana Brands early in 2014. Okay, incredible. And Wanna Brands have become one of the stable uh, top tier brands in the in the North American cannabis industry. The, what I wanted to talk to you about, and I'm sure you're going to have a, a lot of information for the audience, is innovation in edibles at the moment. There's a couple of different things that I'd like to touch on um, that are under that umbrella of innovation in edibles, because over in Europe, we see a lot of the only thing that you'll see in media is going to be a synthetic edible that comes from a drug dealer that's done some sort of damage. So I'd love to be able to explain to the audience how advanced this industry is and uh, what exactly are you guys are up to. So first and foremost, the, the technology involved in making edibles, for everybody who doesn't understand, what is the simplified process without giving too much away? No process. The, the simple process in edibles is um, taking taking the plant, um, generally the, the flower, the buds, the inflorescence, um, and extracting it. And with cannabinoids and terpenes being lipophilic, you're usually using solvents like butane, CO2, or ethanol to create a, an extract. Um, and then you can purify and post-process it with processes like distillation. And then that extract is then infused into products like chocolates, gummies, other edible forms. Um, so it's generally taking the plant, using extraction methods, cleaning it up, and then introducing it into an edible. And the introduction of it into any product per se, is there a specific technology and equipment that gets used for, let's say, obviously, it's probably going to be easy to be done by hand, but if they're a large company like yourselves, is there a certain technology that is given the exact dosage per exact gummy every single time? Or what does the manufacturing line look like at a company of your scale? You know, the interesting thing with cannabis in the United States is how state by state specific regulations and market sizes are. Um, so at WANA, we have multiple different um, methodologies on how to do the infusion from something as small as using lab kits and, and measuring devices into things like pots. You can literally cook in, in pots at very small scales, all the way up to full automated equipment. And at the full automated equipment side, there are API dosing devices that can uh, accurately measure inline dosing for, for uh, the cannabis products. Um, but it really just depends on the methodology of cooking. Okay, incredible. And the product range you guys got is pretty extensive and some very advanced uh, innovations in your blends and form is, for example, the, the new Quick product you guys brought out. Can you maybe give an example of the technology behind uh, bringing that product to market? Yeah, you know, in the early days, cannabis uh, edibles really just were extracts of a specific strain or a specific chemovar of cannabis. Um, these days, we are looking to make more effect specific products. We understand that this plant has a multitude of benefits and a multitude of different effects it can elicit, depending upon that chemovar chemical variety of compounds in there. So what is the formulation of cannabinoids and terpenes that elicit different effects? Um, we know that people use cannab cannabis for effects like relieving anxiety, calming effects, sleep. So our newest formulation called Quick Calm uses a functional blend of just one milligram of THC. So it's not a very intoxicating dose, very low dose of THC, but combines that with 10 milligrams of CBD 
10 milligrams of CBG, and also additionally in the formulation is 50 milligrams of L-theanine, normally found in green tea. This is all enhanced with 30 other botanical terpenes for a calming, relaxing effect. And it's all fast acting, so it takes it from five to 15 minutes. I really think the future of a lot of cannabis products are gonna be these highly formulated products, um, where instead of guessing what the strain might feel or affect, we're formulating them so consumers can rely on the marketing and say, I know this product's gonna work for me for the effect that I want. Okay, so that kind of leads me perfectly to the next topic I want to discuss, and that's the research and development that happens in edibles. You just mentioned there your own unique uh, blend and formulation of ingredients that created the quick calm. Do you see, is this one of the most innovative part or the, the, the most cutting edge part of the edible industry? Is there big money being pumped into R&D and the creation of blends and formulations as a unique IPable uh, component for any organization? I think there is and there isn't. Um, the industry is a little bifurcated in the way that it's doing R&D. <clears throat> I think there are a lot of brands that are sticking towards very simplistic R&D, which is throwing whatever the new hot cannabinoid is, taking some, you know, phrasing off of places like Leafly and, and, and spitting that out. Then there are companies like Wana and others that are actually doing consumer research on the effects. They're doing surveys, they're doing clinical trials. We're trying to understand how these uh, products make people feel, how the different formulations work. And then you also have a, a third piece, which is pharma is getting into this in actually new synthetic cannabinoids that they're formulating. Um, Raphael Mishulam and his team in Israel have started to formulate a variety of CBD uh, like molecules, they're not found in the plant, but they are cannabinoids that do activate a cannabinoid receptors and are being formulated for very specific treatments and for effects. Um, so there's there's a bit of a different approaches um, from very unscientific to very scientific. And that do you see the biotechnology companies now that, that are now able to biosynthesize these molecules in large scale batches, completely clean, precise, replicable over and over. Do you see them taking a market share of the ingredient side of things, let's say from a plant slash extraction model? It depends on where you're located. <clears throat> so when we're talking about synthesis of cannabinoids, there's a few different approaches. Um, one that we've seen growing a, a lot in Canada has been fermentation. You're utilizing bacteria and yeast to produce, you actually genetically modify these organisms, add ingredients, and in their metabolic processes are able to convert raw ingredients and molecules into cannabinoids because they're genetically modified. So we're seeing that for things like CBG in Canada. Um, I've also seen ways to take the actual biomechanical machinery of trichomes where terpenes and cannabinoids are made in the plant and you can isolate those and put them into reactors and these these reactors are able to replicate the environment that trichomes would live in and have them produce cannabinoids um, and then there's always just synthetic production in labs where you're taking raw hydrocarbons, synthesizing them with reagents and producing them in labs. All of these processes end up producing very pure, very isolated forms of cannabinoids. It's going to take for that process to work in each market, the working with governments and other institutions to prove that the method is safe, reliable and producing very pure isolates. In the long term, these will likely be more environmentally friendly, less cost, and providing pure ingredients. So I do see a path forward for them. In the United States right now, without FDA regulation, I don't know that there's going to be a path forward for those soon. Whereas in other markets, particularly in Europe, I think governments are working to start to regulate, understand these processes, and provide a supply chain for them. 
Yeah, it's going to be uh, an interesting few years ahead for the edibles market, both in Europe and in North America, to see how both markets evolve and the different ingredients suppliers, whether they're one size fits all or whether we have one company has to have two different manufacturing outputs to be able to suit the two different markets. You know, the, the, one, the one area that we need to understand better when we're talking about um, these isolated products is what Rafael Mishulam and Ethan Russo and others have been suggesting is that the idea that there's an entourage effect that cannabis plants produce, that THC alone or CBD alone are less effective than the two combined or combined with CBG or CBC or other, other cannabinoids and terpenes. So while we're looking at isolating and purifying single molecules, we need to understand that there are other components that likely synergize together. So when we strip everything apart and have isolated compounds, we need to be looking at how the plants are naturally producing these compounds and seeing if we can mimic and learn from strains that are known for pain relief or anxiety relief um, or, 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 or benefits for sleep and trying to replicate those blends. When we get to a pure pharma model where it's one molecule, one receptor, we start to lose some of the benefits of the plant. So while I do think that a lot of the future will be driven by these new synthetic isolated forms of cannabis. I think that they also need to be combined in structured ways that are formulated and based off of the plant and also shown and tested in research for efficacy and validated in that way. Yeah, I think the holy grail is that if they can isolate the different molecules and, as I said, create their own recipe that is almost replicable to an actual plant, but they can repeat it a billion times over in a safe and conductive manner might be the, the opportunity that's out there for the ingredient suppliers. One last thing I want to touch on before you go is the distribution battle. How do you guys see uh, distribution in the States? I know it's it's state by state at the moment. But compared to Canada, what, what is the distribution like for a, a large scale brand such as yourself? Well, the distribution battle is really outside of even the industry itself. It's in the United States, the fact that there's no really ability to ship across state lines with it being federally illegal still. What it is, is a patchwork of different markets that are all regulated differently utilizing different seed to sale tracking systems using different distribution models. Um, and, and, you know, what you can do in one state is very different than what you can do in another. Um, so that means that there is no real model for how this works in the United States. And it has to be figured out within each market. Some markets are, I think, better regulated, and better set up than others. And when we're talking about distribution, I think one of the really big red flags you should be looking at is what's happening in California, where there are distribution centers that are pushing out and diverting product into the black market. Um, and, and, and it's actually a, a significant portion of what's being produced in California is going through distribution centers being sent to lesser unregulated markets like New York. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work to be done on the distribution model in, in the US for sure. Um, unlike Canada, that has a, a more regulated system. Yeah, when we were over in New York there um, about 10 months ago, there was every California brand under the sun was in all the illegal dispensaries. And one would wonder with uh, no cross-state competition or transactions, how these are getting there. Do you ever see a scenario where before federal legalization, let's say two states that cross border with each other, come to an agreement to come to a deal that they're going to be allowed tra tra uh, cross-border commerce? That's a great question. You know, California's actually already floated that idea of partnering with states like Oregon uh, that is neighboring, also has a legal regulated system and setting up their own state by state interstate commerce. Um, I haven't seen that move forward yet and it raises really interesting questions on how the federal government would view that. Um, I, I do not see a situation where states like California and New York set up a system for interstate commerce. There's too many states in between that haven't legalized yet. And I think that's going to be a hard path forward. Um, I, I do think the, the real holy grail that we're aiming for is federal regulations. Yes, well, let's hope, fingers crossed, that 2023 is the year where we get a, a little bit of gain on the ground because, uh, yeah, we've all got our fingers crossed and it seems to be the logical thing. But... 
like with things in life, the logical thing doesn't normally get the most attention. Mike, thank you very much for taking your time to do this. It's very much appreciated. Thank you so much. It's been fun today. Hopefully we get to chat to you towards the end of the year and there's more good news. But for anybody who wants to check out Warner Brand's collection, I highly recommend going to their website. They are literally a, a phenomenal brand and one of the best product ranges that I've ever come across. So WarnerBrands.com. Mike, thank you again for your time. And uh, until next week, everybody. Thank you.